In the early 1990s, to cope with the flare-up in Nagorno-Karabakh, a distant region many in America knew nothing or little about, U.S. authorities designed a peace deal. Offering territorial swap between the belligerent parties, Armenia and Azerbaijan, the idea soon became known as the Gobel Plan, in reference to Paul Gobel, who first initiated it while serving as special advisor to then U.S. Secretary of State. As part of Topchubashov Center's series of Karabakh interviews, today our guest is Paul Gobel, American scholar, analyst, and columnist. Mr. Gobel, many thanks for finding time for this discussion, which I'm happy to have with you. Do you mind us discussing a little bit uh, the Gobel plan retrospectively before jumping to, to other topics? How it was created, what were its uh, main advantages and shortages, and to what extent it was put on the discussion table back then? Well, the so-called global plan emerged because I was asked by then uh, former, the former Secretary of State to prepare a scope note before his visit to uh, the Caucasus. And uh, because I was writing, I was no longer a U.S. government official, but I was writing this for someone who had the typical American view that if there's a problem, there should be a solution. So that the end of my discussion of the history, complex history of the South Caucasus, I said that the only way it seemed to me that you could have uh, a settlement between Armenia and Azerbaijan as the Soviet Union was falling apart was to change the borders. Republic borders have changed a lot. And the most obvious, easiest in some ways, way to do that was for what was then an Armenian population in Karabakh to become part of Armenia. But the only way that that was sustainable from the point of view of Azerbaijan was for Azerbaijan to be given something it wanted. And that would be the, a corridor uh, connecting Azerbaijan proper with Nakhchivan across what is now Zengizur. I believed that that would not only be something that Azerbaijan would so much want that it might be prepared to concede territory north of there, but also it would have the great advantage, this, this plan so-called, um, of eliminating two marginal areas that played, uh, that were more nationalistic than the cores of their countries and that have played a disproportionate role in the histories of both Armenia and Azerbaijan. For most of the last 40 years, Armenian politics has been dominated by people from or closely connected with Karabakh. And Azerbaijani politics, it should be noted, have been dominated by people rooted in uh, Nakhchivan. What we know about uh, ethnicity and nationalism suggests that people who live in at the edge of community, <clears throat> excuse me, are more likely to become nationalistic than those who are at the core. Someone living in Baku is certainly less likely to think about in nationalistic terms than someone who lives in Nakhchivan. Similarly, someone who lives in Yerevan is going to be less obsessed with an Armenian national agenda than someone who lives in Stepanakert. So it was an idea that this was a way of addressing a problem. At the time, the Soviet Union was falling apart. There was a lot of fluidity. Borders were anything but fixed. Uh, the borders among Union republics had changed more than 200 times uh, after the Soviet Union was set up in 1923. And so it was not unthinkable that this might be a solution. So that was put at the end of a, a, a brief comment at the end of a longer study or longer essay about the issues in the South Caucasus. I did not expect anything to happen after that, but, two things did. First, 
uh, the, um, the former Secretary of State made reference to this and put my name attached to it uh, when he spoke standing next to uh, the, uh, the Iranian Foreign Ministry in Stepanakert uh, in early 92. And then uh, U.S. Secretary of State James Baker now said that it was a plan worth considering, which of course had the effect of raising its status well beyond, well above my pay grade or my intention. I simply wanted to explain that, that there are very few human problems for which there are no, no solutions. They may be complicated, they may take more than one move, but it was not an intention to uh, come up with a grand scheme <clears throat> of how to do things. Now, I believe that at various points over the last 30 years, that idea has informed the thinking of people both in Yerevan and in Baku. <clears throat> and I think we came very, very close to something like that at the Key West conversations uh, a couple decades ago. But in general, the international community has doubled down on the idea that borders must never be changed anymore. Uh, because they're afraid that if you change them one place, you'll change them lots of places. Uh, and, and that's a reasonable perspective, but it's also the case that sometimes borders do get changed and sometimes there are even good reasons for it. I believe that the November 10th declaration that we have seen and that some people, I think mistakenly, refer to as a peace settlement as the end of the conflict, I think it's a, it simply doesn't solve, answer a lot of questions, and that is a problem I'm sure we'll talk about. I think the fact that uh, in its attempt to orchestrate a some kind of a new status quo, a new uh, nonviolent uh, settlement, um, Moscow picked up on the idea that it wasn't going to get Azerbaijan to agree to having any Armenians in Karabakh anymore, or at least any large numbers, and certainly no Azerbaijani forces, unless it did something that Azerbaijan really, really wanted, which was to open a transportation corridor uh, between Azerbaijan and Akhichevan. And given Turkey's involvement in this conflict, that Turkey had an interest in that too, not only because it has the effect of overturning uh, some of the arrangements of the Cars Treaty of 1920, but also because, in principle at least, it sets the stage for a direct, on the ground, east-west transport corridor between Istanbul and Central Asia. And that's a major part of the Turkish world that uh, the president of Turkey wants to promote. So I, I was amused that one uh, Azerbaijani newspaper described the outcome of November 10th as a combination of the Lavrov plan and the Goebel plan, which I think gives it entirely to me entirely too much credit. But I do believe that Baku was very close to being able to completely occupy Karbak to defeat the Ar Armenian army and destroy it, if not to expel it, that had that happened, you would have had a massive refugee flow. And I think that it, from of Armenians out of that region into uh, Armenia, the Republic of Armenia, that would have given Turkey a, or excuse me, given Un uh, Azerbaijan a big black eye. And I think that uh, President Aliyev is to be praised for making the decision to stop before that happened. But I think he was only able to do that in terms of the national interest of the Republic of Azerbaijan and his ally Turkey by the restoration, by the establishment of a corridor between uh, the Republic of Azerbaijan and its non-contiguous autonomous formation, Nakhichevan. So in that sense, what I wrote as a sort of throwaway uh, line uh, to uh, a, a former American senior official who, like most Americans, wants to believe that all problems have solutions, um, be, has, I think, uh, actually taken shape. And I believe 
that with time, this corridor that, that the November 10th declaration calls for will broaden and deepen. That is to say, what is at present anticipated to be only a transportation corridor across Armenian territory will become with time an Azerbaijani uh, zone and that the process will take several years, but I stress that November 10th was not the end. It was simply the closing of one chapter and the opening of a new one, and that I very much hope that uh, President Aliyev and others in Azerbaijan recognize that the most important thing they can do now is to call for talks about all these issues so that they can be solved, perhaps, by diplomatic means, rather than a new uh, outburst of violence, which I think uh, would ultimately, I have no doubt, Azerbaijan could win it. Uh, having said that, I don't think winning that way is in Azerbaijan's best interest. There are better ways to achieve your ends than that. Uh, Mr. Gobel, uh can we elaborate um, uh, on several topics you uh, touched upon? Um, the situation which is currently being established in the South Caucasus, does it echo more the global plan or the Lavrov plan, or is it something totally different? Well, I think the first thing to say is that November 10th is a declaration, not a settlement. Uh, this is not a peace treaty. This is not something where all the, all the uh, arrangements are specified. It's a statement of intention in many ways, and it allowed uh, the Azerbaijanis to end their advance without being embarrassed. It allowed Turkey to uh, expand its connections into the South Caucasus. It gave Armenia hope that not all Armenians, would, ethnic Armenians, would flee from Karabakh, and it gave Russia uh, the possibility of put, uh, inserting 1960 uh, so-called peacekeepers, even though as peacekeepers they're, they're illegally, since peacekeepers are not supposed to be part a, from a country that is a party to the conflict. And Russia, which has a, one military base in Armenia already, and where people are talking about possibly establishing a second Russian military base hardly is excluded. I don't, I don't see what happened as being a settlement, and therefore I don't think it's right to decide whose name is going to attach to it. I think that there were ideas that were floating around uh, that uh, have, seen, have come to fruition in part. I'm happy to say that what I talked about 30 years ago has played some role. I would not be so immodest as to suggest that it was the defining factor, but I do think there's a, a fundamental logic in what I said, and that the recovery of that corridor by Azerbaijan ultimately benefits Azerbaijan, it benefits Turkey, and to the extent that Armenia can maintain some kind of special relationship with the Armenians in Karabakh, it will have the effect of reducing nationalistic elements in both countries and make cooperation more possible. And I think that uh, uh, if the, re uh, the opening of the uh, Zengizur corridor uh, is accompanied by transit rights across Nakhchivan for Armenian uh, goods and services. And if Armenia is, and Azerbaijan has the power to decide whether this will be true, and I hope it will exercise it, Armenia finds itself integrated more into a Azerbaijani, Turkish, Georgian world uh, of trade, then I think there's a possibility for more stability and the gradual working out of this. It's not going to be easy. Too many people have died. Too many people have suffered expulsion. Too many hundreds of thousands of people have lived uh, in refugee camps, in tent cities for too long for all of this to simply 
simply uh, be over because three presidents signed an agreement uh, in Moscow on November 10th. Uh, there are going to be, uh, you know, the number of things that need to be resolved and it haven't been resolved, very large. And I think that Azerbaijanis need to understand that. And so do, does anyone who wants to see peace and stability and economic prosperity come to the South Caucasus. And I think that uh, the celebration of, the, of November 10th was, to put it mildly, premature. It was a major step forward, but it was far, far from the last step. It's going to take a very long time and an awful lot of hard work to go from where we are now after November 10th to a situation in which uh, all the peoples of the region will be better off than they were before. Well, Mr. Gobel, I uh, wanted to uh, discuss the, the uh, Zangazur corridor, which is connecting the mainland Azerbaijan and the Nachman exclave, you uh, partially covered it. My question was, what kind of geopolitical advantages and problems, if you, if you want, may, may it create? Do you have any opinion on that? The, the advantages are obvious for one side. They're less obvious for another side. They are very obvious for Azerbaijan, and they are especially obvious for Turkey. Azerbaijan will, I, I, when I lived in Baku, I remembered the fact, I saw, and I remember to this day, the long lines of Azerbaijanis who had to stand and wait to get a visa from the Iranian embassy in order to take a bus from one part of their country to another. That's unacceptable. That should never have been allowed to happen. And one of the things that opening a corridor will do is eliminate that. Azerbaijanis should be able to go freely from one part of their country to another. If they're not, that will become a continuing source of irritation and problems that governments will have to address. Uh, so Azerbaijan benefits that way. It benefits another way. If this corridor solidifies and grows, it will mean that transit through uh, from Baku to the West, to Europe, is simplified because the number of possible routes increases. The uh, baku jehan route, uh, with respect, is a very risky one because it goes through Javakhetia in Georgia, which is an Armenian district where Armenian nationalism is especially strong and where the danger always exists that someone will decide to stop the trains. So it's critical that you have another uh, way west, because if you do, that will mean that the possibility of blowing up uh, the Javakhetia area uh, will be reduced. I mean, it, it doesn't do you much good to destroy something if the, your opponent has a, another possibility. This gives Azerbaijan another possibility, and that's a very, very big deal. Uh, with respect to Turkey, this is clearly uh, uh, a, a victory for Erdogan's uh, idea about a Turkish world, about a Turkish near abroad, if you will, um, that includes, uh, and this is what's not quite clear yet, uh, the Turkic states of the world and some of the Turkic peoples. And there's a huge difference if what Erdogan is talking about is a union of states and it, it, uh, as opposed to being a union of peoples. And that's an issue that maybe we'll talk about, but it is clearly one that Azerbaijan's going to be affected by. But, but clearly this is a victory for, for Turkey. Uh, it's a, in that sense, it's a huge loss for Russia. I mean, the possibility that troops from a NATO country are on the territory of a former Soviet Republic, other than the Balts, and Estonia and Latvia and Lithuania have always been viewed differently, okay? They just are. But the possibility that there are now NATO troops on the territory of a former Soviet Republic is a huge defeat for the Kremlin. The victory, but, but it is not, that's not the end of the story. There are two groups 
there are three groups that look as if they might be losers from this that in fact will benefit ultimately. The first is Armenia. If there's a corridor going this way, Armenia will find it far easier to link into that than to anything else. And the Armenian economy is a disaster. So the ability to link into an east-west transit route is a great benefit. Second, Armenia is getting the opening of a transit corridor across Nakhichevan uh, that will allow it to trade more with Iran. And that benefits Armenia too. And it solidifies, it integrates all this area. It's a benefit for uh, Iran because Iran will be able uh, to uh, uh, to eventually get in, link in to the east-west uh, rail line from Baku to Istanbul, and it will be able uh, to trade with Armenia as well. So it benefits. Russia's benef Russia will benefit once it gets over the uh, shock of seeing uh, Turkish forces on the territory of a place that Mr. Putin has essentially promised will never see foreign forces, uh, will recognize that stability in the South Caucasus will ultimately work to produce more stability in the North Caucasus. And the situation north of the Caucasus mountain crest is still sufficiently dangerous that Moscow has to worry about that. If Azerbaijan is doing well economically, if Georgia and Armenia begin to start recovery, the odds are that the peoples in north of the in the Russian Federation in the North Caucasus will be less likely to mobilize against Moscow, and so Moscow wins that way. Again, the balance of winning and losing in each case is different, but I don't think and I don't think it's a simple win-win. I think it's one where uh, skillful diplomacy will play up uh, the positive aspects uh, in order to get greater cooperation. Thank you, Mr. Goebel. Uh, last but not least, um, why do you think the West, particularly the United States, lost momentum in the region and hasn't been able to manage the conflict uh, effectively? Do you think it still has leverage and willingness to increase its uh, role in the Nagorno-Karabakh issue and ensure genuine conflict resolution work is done? Well, I'm going to say something which may come, may, may sound radical. The problems of the people in the Caucasus, Southern Caucasus should be, should be and will be solved primarily by the peoples of the South Caucasus. I have argued for a very long time that the Minsk group, which somehow promised a deus ex machina in which the outside powers would come and come up with a solution was a nonsense. That the best Minsk could do was to promote uh, meetings between the Armenian and Azerbaijani leaders so that they could thrash things out. When the Minsk group played that role, as it did in the lead up to um, Key West, things went in the right direction. When on the other hand, it went back to this notion that somehow outsiders would impose things, um, then the West found itself in a weakened position because it simply doesn't have the leverage in the Caucasus that Russia does. And since the West didn't want to see a Russian solution, uh, which would have been vastly more pro-Armenian than uh, pro-Azerbaijani, unless Baku had been willing to change sides and become a Russian client state, something I find unthinkable from the Aliyev government. <coughs> the West was not, the West was essentially playing a waiting game. Part of that, of course, reflects just the situation on the ground. There are places where American power can be brought to, to bear, and there are places where it's very much more difficult. Right now, we're in the midst, we, we, we have been for the last four years with an administration in Washington that has sought to reduce America's profile in lots of places. And less attention was paid. And we see some of the consequences. And I think part of the reason that Baku decided to move when it did was precisely because it saw uh, the 
period of American disinterest or, or neglect ending. And therefore, it was a time when Azerbaijan could move along with Turkey uh, with much less concern about the reaction in the West. The second, the second thing is that if we're going to see progress, it's again going to be negotiated between Baku and Yerevan. The Russians would very much like to keep playing. But I think November, if you were looking, if you want to see the ultimate big loser for November 10th, it's the Minsk group. I fail to see what it's going to do. That doesn't mean it will cease to exist. Um, diplomatic activities tend to have a life of their own, independent of whether uh, they, are, uh, they are actually playing a role. I, for many years, kept attached to my computer screen uh, the factoid that the last meeting of the League of Nations took place in 1946, long after the League of Nations had, in effect, ceased to exist. I think that uh, I, I think that I I I would like to see uh, the international community involved, but I would like to see it involved promoting agreements between Baku and Yerevan not trying to impose anything. I think it's critical that the West play a role in helping to rebuild uh, the destruction that was visited upon Karabakh and the adjoining uh, so-called buffer territories. This is going to be incredibly expensive. Even with the best will in the world, it's going to be very difficult to move all the people back who were forced out, dealing with property issues, dealing with uh, civil administration, who's going to be in charge, how you're going to establish civil administrations where if those were under the control of someone else. All of those remain open questions. Can the international community, that is in this case the West, play a useful role? Yes, I think so. Are we, are we focused on that just now? No, but I think the change of administration in Washington almost certainly will be will result in a greater American attention to those aspects. That isn't to say, uh, you know, suddenly there's going to be uh, an American base in Azerbaijan. I don't know that you'd want one, but it, it, that it's not, it's not going to, that's not what I'm talking about. What I'm talking about is promoting through America's good offices, diplomatic negotiations between the Azerbaijani government and the Armenian government. And that, it will be useful to, just as Turkey has been a useful ally in what Azerbaijan has been trying to do, gaining some more support from the West, uh, from the United States will be helpful as well. All the more so because France and likely following France, much of the European Union is going to be very attentive to making sure that Armenia doesn't lose too much and that there are historical and cultural reasons for that, that you know better than I. Uh, so I would think that this is a very propitious time, as long as no one thinks all the problems have been solved and that we have a peace. What we have is yet another armistice. And I would just note that when I wrote my infamous global plan 30 years ago, I said that everyone dealing with it needs to remember that there is a huge difference between an armistice and a peace. An armistice is when the fighting stops because one side or the other has either won or both sides are exhausted. A peace is when there is a new arrangement, of a new balance of power created that both sides see they are walking away with something they want. If you don't get that, then you're not then you will not have a peace you'll simply have another armistice which will almost in, inevitably lead to a new war uh, dear mr gobel thank you very much for this interesting conversation and for your valuable thoughts oh my pleasure thank you